March 20th. U-953 cruised with the strong current on periscope depth. At 9.20, I identified several mastheads at the easterly horizon. There was no sound detection. Ten minutes later, the tips had grown, and the smokestacks of seven cargo ships and four destroyers became clearly visible above the silvery surface. I was intoxicated by the view, gleeful at the thought of sending some of the black monsters to the bottom. I ordered speedily, on battle stations both half ahead. Weeks and months of waiting and taking punishment would now he rewarded. I set the boat on a collision course with the small convoy and calculated my chances. Two escorts swept ahead of the bulky ships and two secured their wake. Their starboard side was open for attack. Berger, who was at the controls, handled the boat like an old professional. I was pleased with my choice of a new chief. While U-953 lay solidly in ambush, the small convoy made no evasive move. It ploughed toward Lizard Head or Falmouth Harbour with unbelievable frivolity. I was exultant over these easy kills and commanded, Starboard 10, right so equal sign, hold her steady. I took a quick sweep of the horizon. A few tiny aircraft dotted the sky. Henneker plotted the course and the first seaman's mate adjusted the dials of the computer. Open tube doors. Ready for firing, new distance 2,000, both full ahead. U-953 raced at high speed, well concealed against the targets, momentarily ready to shoot and destroy. Then came a report that wrecked the attack. Tube doors don't fully open. A string of oaths escaped my teeth. Try again, you must open the doors. Seconds passed and the boat surged forward. Can't get the doors open all the way linkage is bent shouted the exec through the voice tube. For the last time you must get them open, I hollered. They don't move at all, cried the exec, climbing into the tower in consternation. Didn't you check them after we hit the rocks? Yes, sir, I did. They functioned then. Enraged and frustrated, now knowing that he had not checked the doors according to prescribed procedures, I put the boat aground. Then I rushed into the bow compartment hoping to solve the problem. Several hands were still trying to turn the linkage, but the doors and bow caps remained locked in half-open position. The breakdown deprived us not only of our victories, but also of all chances of continuing the patrol. In fact, the situation was worse than anything we had previously experienced. With the outer torpedo doors frozen ajar, the inner doors were our only protection against the sea, and they were too frail to withstand the shock of a depth charge explosion. I recalled the air raid in Brest, when a single bomb, exploding 50 metres from our boat, had broken off an interior door, even though the outer door was closed perfectly. I felt an icy chill run down my back. An encounter such as the one we had had the previous day would easily knock in our interior doors and drown all of us within seconds. Blaming myself for having taken my exec's early finding at face value, and not having checked the tube door's mechanism myself when we were still near a shipyard, I now faced the dim prospect of making the long haul back to Norway. With but one tube in firing order, I grimly prepared for our silent run to home base through the deadly waters between England and Ireland. After the tide had broken, I lifted the boat from the bottom and steered her westward. Death stood up before our eyes when a raging depth charge barrage the one that destroyed U-327 thundered on our starboard side near Lizard Head. That day was doomsday for two other boats. U-1003 was sunk in the North Channel and U-905 was destroyed near the Hebrides. The battle continued to be a one-sided affair. Our boats were sunk methodically at the rate of one a day. The thunderous receptions our newcomers received in the North Channel and in traps near Land's End and Lizard Head seemed to me a clear indication that the British had been informed of our assignments. It was during those weeks of our frenzied self-destruction that I lost one of my last old friends and classmates. Riedel, in command of U-242 and on his first mission as a captain, was lost somewhere around England. He sank quietly. No one knew exactly where his coffin went down. We cleared the North Channel, manoeuvred around the Hebrides, and snorkelled cautiously in the Satin Sea. We circumvented countless destroyers along the way, and more near the Shetland Islands, and escaped a last British threat in the Norwegian Sea. As U-953 approached the majestic mountains, 
The Allies gave up their hunt in the anticipation that we would return. I entered Bergenfjord submerged, without signalling for an escort, then surfaced in utter despair and frustration. We had nothing to show for our long and agonising voyage, nothing at all except our lives. Grey clouds hung low in the sky when U-953, once again old and rust-bitten, fastened her lines at the quay. It was 1610, on April 7th, 1945. No one expected us, no one was there to greet us. It began to drizzle as the crew entered the compound. Bergen and the hills disappeared in the chilly squall. It was a sad sundown, full of misgivings. The Commandant 11th U-boat flotilla speedily arranged a dinner reception. I reported our mission uncompleted and said that we were lucky to get back alive. I told him of the convoy that had passed safely in front of our blocked torpedo tubes. There is always a next time, said the commanding officer confidently. The British don't simply vanish. You will have plenty of targets to shoot at on your next patrol. He assured me that success lay ahead of us, that the newest type U-boats were expected any day, and that conventional boats used in training flotillas were now pouring into port in greater numbers. Our conversation dragged on. We kept talking shop, never touching on the war at home. I had been awake for five consecutive days, and without rest for seven weeks, and I felt an insuperable desire to go to sleep. When I noticed that the drinks had begun to affect my men, I rose abruptly, ending the party. The following morning I delivered U-953 into the shipyard for a thorough inspection. Her damages proved to be more severe than we had thought. Since she required a dry dock for these extensive repairs, it was decided to transfer her to our base in Trondheim. Armed with the report, which provided new reasons for ridding ourselves of the chief, I gathered up my logbook and charts and went to see Senior Officer West. I was greeted by a nervous man in meticulous blues. Worry had replaced the ruthlessness he displayed back in May 1944, before the Allies had struck. Without mincing words, I asked him to replace my chief. We don't have an engineer with the qualifications you wish, he declared. They are in limited supply. I suggest that you train Selda in the fjord before you leave for your next patrol. Sir... I have been patient and have tried many times to teach him to handle the boat. He just doesn't have the aptitude. It was my chief warrant officer who did the chief's job. Selda would never have brought us back into port. Grudgingly, the senior said that he would look into the situation. I left his office with the feeling that the matter was not yet settled. The showdown came the next day while I was preparing boat and crew for the transfer to Trondheim. Around dusk, I was summoned by the senior. Your chief has seen me, the senior began. He complained that you confined him to the wardroom for most of the patrol. Why did you have to take this drastic measure? And why didn't you tell me about it? Sir, it was necessary for the boat's safety. I did not mention it because I thought it irrelevant. Quite the contrary. The matter is serious enough. It changes the entire concept. I now understand your situation. I certainly do not approve of your action. Is that clear? I beg to remind you, sir, that the captain's responsibility begins with the safety of ship and crew. If that is jeopardised, he has standing authorization to take any measures he sees fit. The captain is the sole judge of a situation, and of the steps needed to meet it. As captain, I did what I judged was necessary to save boat and crew. I grant you all that, but you should not have resorted to such a solution. I see the matter clearly now. Your chief will be removed. Despite the urgency of my departure for Trondheim, the senior engaged me in a lengthy conversation. He said that close to 60 old-type U-boats were in process of being fitted out for the front. More important, 80 large and 40 small-type submersibles of the newest design were nearing the end of their training, and would be ready presently, in two weeks at most, to strike in an unprecedented offensive. Soon we would have more than 150 U-boats sailing around the British Isles cutting off the Allies' supplies for their continental front. I listened to the news with fascination and excitement. Yet it all seemed too simple. According to Rosing, Germany would be resurrected in just a matter of weeks. I wondered whether he had heard the latest armed forces communiques. The same evening, April 11th, 
I sailed U-953 out of Bergen Harbour. Aboard was a pilot, a lieutenant from the Coast Guard, who was familiar with the tricky waterways inside the fjords. The boat hammered northward through the dark waters, defying the British torpedo boats and submarines which had infiltrated the fjords and had sunk several of our ships. For three nights we snaked through narrow channels in inky darkness. We slid past cliffs by the margin of a hair, escaped death at Helisoe, where U-486 had been torpedoed the night before, ran aground near Arlesund, but slipped off the rocks in the rising tide with diesels screaming in reverse, roared around lofty mountains out to sea, challenged radar impulses for an eternity, then swung into a hole in the mountains which turned out to be another fjord, barely missed ramming the cliffs at Smola, where the Norwegians had changed the beacon light to trap us, and finally arrived at the end of the third night in Trondheim, where I moored the boat in the concrete bunker. It was six o'clock on April 14th, since it was too early to arrange with the 13th U-boat flotilla to quarter the crew and dry dock the boat, I settled for the morning coffee. We tuned in a German radio station and soft music travelled through the compartments. I was sipping my first cup in my tiny nook when the announcer interrupted, Stand by for a special bulletin, we will bring you important news. As the music resumed, my tiredness vanished, for a special bulletin always meant good news. What the good news could be was beyond my imagination. Just the previous night we had heard that our Ruhr industrial region was surrounded by the Allies, that the British were on their way to Hamburg, that the Americans had occupied Darmstadt, Frankfurt and Stuttgart, that the Black Forest was being swept by the French, that the Russians had occupied Vienna and were storming Berlin. And if a miracle could save Germany from downfall now, it would have to be a gigantic miracle. Now the music cut off and the voice came on again. This is a special bulletin. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the President of the United States, died on April the 12th. Providence has removed one of the fiercest enemies of our country. Providence is with the German people. Roosevelt's death is of far-reaching significance. The unity of the Allies will soon break down and the war will turn in our favour. I repeat, Franklin Delano Roosevelt has died in the United States. The announcer's voice was drowned in the brassy chords of a military march. My men, who had listened silently, continued their breakfast. Quite obviously, the news did not seem important enough to them to divert their attention from their boat, their homes, their families. As for myself, I could see nothing in Roosevelt's death that offered Germany any encouragement. Someone else would step into his place and continue the same remorseless course. Victorious armies do not simply turn around and walk off a battlefield. The compound of the flotilla, though at one time an important base of the U-boat war in the Arctic, was small and I did not meet anyone I knew. I reported our arrival and had the crew accommodated in the barracks. The move from boat to quarters was easily accomplished. A toothbrush, some underwear, U-boat fatigues. These were all that we had to call our own. To keep myself informed, I took the shortwave radio from the boat into my room. The war news sent my thoughts wandering back to the places where I had spent my youth, to Frankfurt and the Black Forest where German people and German soil were already under Allied rule. Now the rest of Germany was being crushed between two giant forces, and the fighting was so desperate that young and old, women as well as men, were told to make a last stand to fight with tooth and fingernail and a panzerfaust against the mighty invaders. My war plunged downhill along with the nations. On April 17th, I received notice that our boat had suffered almost irreparable damages. The bow tubes had been knocked out of alignment by the blow, and they had to be realigned. This long and difficult procedure would delay our next mission considerably. To make matters worse, the dry dock would not be available for some time. I became increasingly irritated. With sudden and terrifying clarity, I now saw that the war was lost. I accepted what I saw and I pictured all of us ending up in an immense prison camp at the mercy of our merciless enemies. We would be reviled and brutalised, and there would be no way out except death by starvation. Yet there was one way out of the horror that would engulf us, one way to escape intolerable humiliation. Down at the waterfront lay my boat, 
When she was fully equipped, I could sail her to South America, to Uruguay or Argentina, perhaps. Absconding with the boat seemed suddenly the only means to survive the catastrophe. How lucky I was that I had been able to preserve her for a final task. Instantly, I put the wild impulse into practical planning. I sent Henneker to secure the necessary charts without telling him of my intentions. For days on end, I stayed in my room, poring over the maps and plotting escape routes. I reckoned and calculated my chances for reaching the Rio de la Plata. I planned on reducing the crew to a skeleton, taking only reliable, loyal, unmarried men, thus reducing the risk of being betrayed. I knew that I could count on most of my men, but was wary of including my officers. The chief had been transferred, and a new one not acquainted with the crew would be a heavy burden. The same applied to the exec and the ensign, both too young to grasp the situation. In my mind, I selected the few key men whom I would first draw into my conspiracy. No more than a few, for I was playing a dangerous game. I would not only be flouting naval authority, but also a strong group of diehards who advocated turning Norway into a fortress and starting a war of their own to achieve some obscure victory. In the meantime, German resistance fell apart in Italy, Austria and inside Germany. Now only a madman could speak of recovery. But German oaths and patriotism and discipline were so deeply rooted that many a sane man threw his life into the fires of a lost cause. Among them were the captains and crews of our boats at sea. U-boats were sunk at the rate of two and three a day as they sailed from Bergen, Christiansand and Kiel on their first and final mission. Hundreds of good men died futilely to honour their pledge to duty and country. On April 27th, U-953 still lay at the pier, and it seemed that she would never be repaired in time for me to execute my plan. Then I was taken by surprise by an order to report to Senior Officer West in Bergen. Puzzled by the urgent call, I prepared myself for a long train ride through half of Norway. Because I owned nothing but U-boat fatigues which were unsuitable for the trip, I requisitioned a ski outfit from the supply laid in for those who had taken their leaves in the Norwegian mountains during better days. Dressed in blue ski pants and a light grey anorak with food for four days in a knapsack, I departed from Trondheim and began the journey through the snow-covered mountains. Late in the afternoon of April 30th, the train pulled into Bergen station. I managed to find the compound by memory. Someone led me to a room. I felt like a stranger in a hotel. Tuesday, May 1st. At 8.30 I knocked at the door of the senior officer's sanctuary. I begged to report as requested, sir. You were expected yesterday, was Capitaine Rosing's dry reply. Sir, I made it as fast as I could. Never mind. Your boat will not be ready in time for the great offensive. We need every experienced man on the front, and you are going to take command of another boat which is ready for patrol. The boat is about to arrive in Christiansand from a German port. Yes, sir. You are going to sail against England with vigour and determination. Admiral Dönitz has ordered all conventional U-boats to leave Germany for Norway, and we will continue our war at sea from here. We shall never surrender. We'll hold out, and our U-boats will force our terms upon the enemy. He handed me an order to report to the 27th U-boat flotilla, then continued. It occurs to me that you might as well act as a courier. I'll give you some top-secret papers which I want you to deliver to our bases in Oslo, Horten and Christiansand. I expect to have them ready this afternoon. I was too stunned to make any reply. There was no limit to insanity. I clicked my heels, turned and left the room. Once outside, I gritted my teeth because my marvellous plan to escape was suddenly put beyond execution. But then it dawned on me that a new boat, already equipped for patrol, would give me an even better and quicker chance to reach South America. My determination to flee was strengthened by headquarters' irrational decision to force the battle at sea until the last man in the U-boat force would lie on the bottom. The effects of Dönitz's order were immediately apparent. In the compound and along the waterfront, last-minute preparations were made to send still more old-type U-boats to their deaths. Mechanics and dockhands laboured violently, hectically, as if the Reich's existence depended upon their efforts alone. Meanwhile, bewildering news spread throughout the compound. 
The latest armed forces communique had revealed that the battle for Berlin was nearing its climax. Hitler himself had taken command of the troops defending the capital. At 19 o'clock I received the secret papers for which I had been waiting. By that hour it was too late to depart, so I had a meagre dinner in the officers' mess hall and left to get a good night's sleep for my trip to Christian Sand Harbour. I tuned in the radio and waited for news stretched out on my bed. The music stopped. The announcer's voice, first stuttering, then loud and harsh, broke the brief silence. Attention, I have an important announcement to make. Instantly I was wide awake. I looked at my watch. It was exactly 21.30. The music was a slow-moving passage from a Wagner opera, heralding a grave disclosure. I guessed that Berlin had fallen into Soviet hands, or even that a ceasefire had halted the senseless massacre. Then the announcer spoke again, low and solemn. Our Führer, Adolf Hitler, fighting to his last breath, fell for Germany in his headquarters in the Reichschancellery. On April the 30th, the Führer appointed Grand Admiral Dönitz to take his place. The Grand Admiral and successor to the Führer now speaks to the German people. This was the end, the end of the torture, the end of the war and of German history. The one impossible disaster was an accomplished fact. Hitler's death could only mean final recognition of defeat. Vaguely I heard Dönitz's voice far in the background. He was saying that the military struggle had to go on to save the lives of millions of refugees, that we must continue to fight and defend our rights. His statement was drowned in the tunes of the national anthem. An immense sadness overpowered me. Along with tens of millions of Germans, I had given everything I had owned, loved and cherished. I had sacrificed home and family for the sake of my country and victory, and had blindly believed in the cause, and had fought and hoped and suffered and waited for the miracle in deep devotion. Now it was all over, simply over. The end. Heartsick, I struggled to the mess hall. There sat the commanding officer and a few others, pale, grief-stricken, confused. One said, he died on the barricades, we have to go on. Someone else declared, he gave us an example. We must hold out and continue here in Norway. The Allies will have a hell of a time smoking us out of the mountains. Others, voicing their opinion cautiously, suggested that this was indeed the end. Hopelessness soon silenced the exchange. We dispersed. The next morning, May 2nd, I took the express to Oslo and arrived late in the evening. On May 3rd, I delivered one envelope of secret papers to the given address, then boarded a train to Horten. In Horten, I handed over a second envelope to the adjutant of the naval base and continued by rail on the final leg of my last assignment. On May 4th, after a sleepless night on a wooden bench in an unheated compartment, I arrived in Christian Sand around seven o'clock. A blue sky spanned the city. I hiked down a narrow, dusty road that led to the compound, strolled through pines and crippled firs into the extensive complex and entered the executive offices of the flotilla at 8.30. A youthful adjutant showed me into the commanding officer's elaborate room. Before me rose a decorated officer in blues who had been a U-boat commander when hunting and shooting had been a pleasure. Kapitän Jürgensen was one of the lucky few who had been withdrawn from the front just in time to escape the Holocaust. I beg to report for duty, sir, I saluted. Oh yes, naturally I've been informed of your arrival. You're supposed to take a new command. Your boat hasn't arrived yet. I assume she'll sail into port any time. Why don't you accommodate yourself in the meantime? I'll let you know. That's all for now. This short, cool reception gave me a strange premonition. Something was odd about Jürgensen's behaviour, something that went beyond the strain that had signed his face. He seemed to be absent-minded and flustered. I walked out of his office convinced that he knew of some calamity that he had been unwilling to divulge. I hurried down to the waterfront. Two old-type U-boats lay alongside the pier. Poking up beyond them was the strangely formed conning tower of a smaller boat of the new class. As I approached to examine the new weapon, I spotted her captain's white cap, then his face above the rim of the bridge. Angerman, is it really you? I shouted across the water. Hello, I see you're still alive, he called back. Ill weeds grow apace. Is one of these old jalopies yours? He pointed toward an old diving tube. 
No, I am waiting to take command of another one, still to arrive. I don't want to discourage you, but out there is hell, and she may never get here. We have just crossed the Skagerrak, and I know. Aircraft all over. The sky is black with them, and the devil is loose in Germany. Berlin is taken by the Soviets. The Americans have met them at the Elbe, and we escaped Kiel under direct fire from land. He wiped the sweat off his face and continued, The Tommies have captured Kiel. The first tanks reached the Tirpitz Pier when I was in the middle of the bay, and they began firing their big cannon, and God, it's a miracle that we made it here. We lost at least seven boats in the crossing, and I stopped counting this morning. I tell you, it can't last much longer. Angerman was reciting still more horrors, when another small new boat ploughed up to the pier, a man threw a line. At that moment I recognised another face below the captain's white cap. My good friend Fred Schreiber had also escaped the massacre in the Baltic. Fred raised his right hand in salute. His flashing eyes had lost their vividness. His skin was ashen. I knew that disaster had struck. As soon as the gangplank was laid down, I rushed aboard to greet him. We pressed our hands in silence. He pulled a crumpled paper from his pocket and handed it to me, and his eyes grew moist. I unfolded the sheet. It was a deciphered signal from headquarters. All U-boats, attention all U-boats, cease fire at once, stop all hostile action against Allied shipping, Donuts. As I stared at the message, its letters blurred. I heard Fred saying, We received it a half hour ago. It's the finale. I felt a sudden pain welling up in my heart. I turned around and fought back my tears, for I had never been taught to lose. As of May 5th, 1945, hostilities came to a halt. Dönitz, the head of the new government, had agreed to a preliminary surrender to the British armies, involving all of our armed forces in the northern region of the continent. The next day, every seaman on base was electrified by another radiogram from Dönitz. The admiral who had led the U-boats to glory and to disaster mourned for the faithful who lay on the bottom and gave thanks to those few survivors of the monstrous battle. My U-boat men, six years of war lie behind you. You have fought like lions. An overwhelming material superiority has driven us into a tight corner from which it is no longer possible to continue the war. Unbeaten and unblemished, you lay down your arms after a heroic fight without parallel. We proudly remember our fallen comrades who gave their lives for Führer and Fatherland. Comrades, preserve that spirit in which you have fought so long and so gallantly for the sake of the future of the Fatherland. Long live Germany, your Grand Admiral. This was the message that put an end to the suffering. It admitted defeat for the first time. The murdering had finally come to an end. Henceforth, we would be able to live without fear that we had to die tomorrow. An unknown tranquillity took possession of me as I realised fully that I had survived. My death in an iron coffin, a verdict of long standing, was finally suspended. The truth was so beautiful that it seemed to be a dream. Nominally, the war ended on May 5th, 1945, but I had to fight for almost six months more before I won my battle for survival. At first, Germany's surrender left me feeling deceived and betrayed. I concluded that it relieved me of my sworn obligations to folk and fatherland and military discipline. Since everything I held dear was dead, my only concern was to be free. But between me and freedom lay the vast, creaking apparatus of the Allied occupation. I assumed, quite correctly, that all who had fought for Germany faced a slow, painful, humiliating process of internment and interrogation and grudging repatriation and I refused to subject myself to the whim and convenience of Allied military officials, who were at best bewildered by their enormous task, and at worst vindictive and cruel to their former enemies. I was determined to flee and to find my own peace. I vowed that nothing would stop me from doing precisely as I pleased. In the days after Germany's capitulation, I found no cause for confidence in the victors. The British went on attacking those last U-boats which fled German posts for Norway, and I thought that they were merely continuing their policy of extermination. I spent most of my time at the waterfront with my old friend Fred Schreiber, watching as a few other captains dashed into Christiansand in their battered shell-punctured U-boats. Eckel of U-2325 and Wex of U-2354 
told us that five of their companion boats had been sunk while crossing the Danish Sea and the Skagerrak. This brought our U-boat casualties since war's end to 16, and to 779 the grand total of U-boats sunk since the start of the war. May 7th was a day when hysteria reigned supreme all around us. The Norwegians wildly celebrated their liberation. Three of our seamen, who were found drunk in the company of Norwegians, were put in chains by Jürgensen, the commanding officer, who grimly planned a court-martial as a warning. And last but not least, the British came ashore in Kristiansand, stirring speculation about an imminent seizure of our compound. Against this hectic backdrop, I persuaded my good friend Fred Schreiber to escape with me to South America. Reluctantly, he fell in with my plan. We would abscond with his small boat and men, schnorkel all the way to Trondheim, where my larger U-953 lay waiting, then sail her with a select crew to Argentina. That night, just as we were about to put our plan into effect, everyone on base was ordered to report to the repair shop for a show being staged by Capitaine Jürgensen and his aides. Fred and I recoiled in horror when we entered the dimly lighted square where the U-boat crews had formed a human horseshoe facing the white-walled shop. There, suspended from a makeshift scaffold, hung three nooses. Below stood a large table with three high stools lined up on top. In front of the gallows was a crude bench covered with a huge navy war flag. A ship's lantern, placed on the red cloth, cast an eerie light on a navy sabre and a copy of Hitler's book Mein Kampf. A band of armed marines took up position behind the stage. Staff officers rushed back and forth. Lieutenant Langer, Jürgensen's young adjutant, shouted frantic orders. As the crowd stirred uneasily, Jürgensen began speaking. Soldiers, I have called you together to demonstrate how we will avoid another 1918. I am going to make an example of these three deserters. An example that will strike fear into the hearts of any men with revolutionary tendencies. We will protect and nourish those ideals instilled in us by our martyred Fuhrer. Guards, bring these men to justice. What followed was a perfect nightmare come to life. The captives, their hands tied behind their back, were led into the square. Momentarily they were paralysed by the sight of the nooses. Then they broke away and fled. Langer shot one man repeatedly in the back. As the fugitive fell on his face, the two others surrendered. Then all three were brutally dragged back to the scaffold. Langer shouted a long list of trumped-up charges. He then demanded the severest punishment, death by hanging. No one in the crowd dared to protest in the face of the many rifles. Jürgensen pronounced the three men guilty on all counts and condemned them to be hanged by the neck until death has separated body from soul. The guards were then ordered to execute the sentence. But before the three doomed men reached the platform, they broke free again and began fighting desperately for their lives. Shots were fired. There was struggling, trampling. Dust rose in the lantern's gloomy light. The three were recaptured, but with superhuman force they broke free once again. They fought, bit, kicked and punched, until they were surrounded and again overwhelmed. Now Jürgensen cried, Shoot these men dead! Don't hang them! Shoot them! The marines heard the call and all went very fast. One man raised his rifle and fired point blank. The mate's face flew off like a pancake. The two other prisoners collapsed and were riddled with bullets. The marines dragged the three bodies against the wall of the repair shop and left them there. The crews were dismissed. The guards marched away. Everyone vanished. Long after midnight, two petty officers helped me lift the bodies into a rowboat. We fastened heavy weights to their feet and neck, then rowed out into the middle of the fjord. Three splashes and the dead seamen had at least received a sailor's burial. The execution completely reversed Fred's decision to sail that night, or any other night. For the next few days, the compound remained in the grip of a deathly calm. Most of the men were stunned and guilt-sickened by the organised murder. The deed drained off my last lingering hopes. When Germans killed Germans without a qualm, there could be no future for me in my homeland, no mercy at the hands of the conquerors. To my surprise, however, the British ignored our U-boats at the base and did nothing to harm other boats which complied with their order to put into the nearest English port, flying a black flag from the extended periscope. 
and my fears were further allayed by my first contact with a British officer. It was mid-May when I was sent to see the British district commander in a small town east of Christiansand. My mission was to arrange the evacuation of all naval personnel from the U-boat base. I made the trip by armoured car with two seamen holding submachine guns at the ready, for we had been warned against an ambush by vengeful members of the Norwegian underground. I found the English commander, one Colonel MacGregor, dressing belatedly in his room in the village hotel. MacGregor closed the door behind me and offered me a chair. I've just taken my morning exercises, he said apologetically in an interesting Scottish brogue. Running helps me to keep trim, you see. A man of my age must watch his weight. Then MacGregor poured me a glass of wine. It's the best I could find in this damned town. And as he continued dressing, MacGregor told me a little about himself. He had parachuted into the mountains three months ago and had organised the Norwegian resistance. He then explained that his orders called for all German troops to leave Christiansand within three days and go to the nearby island of Tremoe. I was completely disarmed by MacGregor's informality, and I decided that it was neither disgraceful nor dangerous to cooperate with such an officer. In the heat of a May afternoon, Thousands of Navy men poured over the bridge into the well-kept garrison of Tromoe, which had been a German coast artillery base for years. Our enlisted men were billeted in barracks. Fred and I joined a group of officers and took over a neat farmhouse that had served as a club. The total absence of British troops and our unharried settlement into domesticated groups led us to think that our stay on Tromoe would be brief and quite tolerable. It proved to be neither. Despite our strict self-imposed routine, which included many organised activities and an early curfew, the hours dragged and the days inched by. The compound was agog with rumours and wild speculation about our future and that of our homeland. Our insecurity and resentment grew as the days became weeks equal sign and still no word from the British. Some men were unable to maintain their equilibrium under the subtle pressures of our defeat and confinement. One officer hanged himself from a rafter in the attic, and we buried him between the red rocks of Tremoe. Three weeks after our arrival, a riot broke out in a barracks occupied by enlisted men who claimed to be non-Germans pressed into service. They barricaded themselves in their quarters and shot an officer who came to investigate. The mutiny was not put down until the commotion attracted British troops from the mainland. Two nights later, the English returned for reprisals. We were awakened from a sound sleep, herded at bayonet point into a meadow, and ordered to strip. We marched forth and back between two rows of Tommies, while their comrades ransacked our quarters, searching for hidden weapons. Our nudity was a calculated indignity. It erased the distinction between officers and men, and informed us all that our subjugation was complete. The Tommies found little that interested them, and after shooting up our quarters in disappointment, they departed as suddenly as they had arrived. In early July they came again, this time to set up a board of inquiry under the sky. We were informed that we had to register to get our discharge papers. Elated by our renewed prospects for prompt repatriation, I gladly gave a Britisher all the information he wanted. When he asked about my hometown, I named Frankfurt as a likely place to start over again though I now had no connection with the city except sad memories and a bank account of worthless currency. But the Tommies departed, and our hopes were soured by two more weeks of interminable waiting. The break finally came on July 24th. A small detachment of British troops arrived and collected those of us who had elected to be discharged in the American and the French occupation zones. We were marched down to barges waiting in the fjord, then ferried to the small port of Mandel. There we were surrounded by mixed British-Norwegian troops, who displayed an alarmingly martial look. That night we slept in a field in British tents, with our bellies filled for the first time in weeks with Irish stew. In the morning we went through a long ordeal of search and interrogation. To put us at a disadvantage and make deceit more difficult, the Tommies again ordered us to strip, then took us for questioning in a nearby barn. My inquisitor was a British officer about fifteen years my senior. For the first time I was asked, and I honestly answered questions that would be put to me often in the years to come. What was your last position in the Navy? 
U-boat commander. I thought we had all of you chaps eliminated. How many Allied ships have you sunk? I don't know. Come now, didn't you report your sinkings? Of course I did, but I had no interest in keeping count. Does that mean you hope to disown responsibility for what you've done? Sir, I did my duty. I stand on it. Well, let's not argue that point, but we have cleaned up your ranks pretty well, haven't we? There may be two dozen captains still alive. Besides me, two or three of them may have fought through most of the war. Have you been a member of the Nazi party? No. Have you been a member of the Hitler Youth? No. Have you ever been a member of any of the party's organisations? No. Nonsense, that's what all you Germans say. You had to belong to at least one of the organisations. How else could you have become an officer in the Navy, especially a U-boat captain? Come on, at least admit that you were a member of the Hitler Youth. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but you are misinformed. The Navy did not recruit officers from the Hitler Youth, and membership in the party was not a prerequisite for joining the Navy. We had only to meet the same sort of qualifications your Navy asks. I've heard otherwise. I must warn you to tell the truth. Any false statement will incur a heavy penalty. You had better admit your membership now and save yourself a lot of trouble. We've captured all the party's records, and it is easy for us to find the truth. These are the facts. I have nothing to add. The Inquisitor broke off his questioning and consulted a heavy volume the Allies wanted list. Finding nothing, he asked me how I had managed to survive, and seemed startled by some accounts I gave him of my narrow escapes. Finally, he stamped my discharge papers and handed them to me with a bleak smile. Take good care of these. Without them, you're liable to end up behind barbed wire. And Captain, good luck. Late that afternoon, I was at the rail of a grimy old freighter when she sailed for Germany. Several thousand discharged servicemen crowded the deck and watched the Norwegian shore fade away. There was no laughter, no rejoicing, just silence. We were all back on deck the next morning, July 26th, when our vessel entered the wide delta of the Weser River and was shunted by two tugboats to a quay in Bremerhaven Harbour. We were silent too as we set foot again on German soil. At once, American troops took us under their command and collected our discharge papers. We were loaded on trucks, transported to a camp on the outskirts of Bremerhaven, fumigated and fed. Fred and I shared a small tin of sardines and few biscuits of our own. Then we rolled up in blankets and fell asleep under the stars. At dawn on July 27th, about 3,000 of us were herded onto a freight train bound for Frankfurt, where we were to be released. It was a long, slow, dismal trip. We passed wheat fields ready for the harvest, countryside stations and crossroads guarded by American soldiers, highways clogged with Allied armoured columns, and mountains of rubble that once had been beautiful cities. We reached Frankfurt late the second afternoon of our journey, and as the train snaked through the suburbs and then along the Shamain Kai at the main river, I bitterly accepted the fact that my hometown, destroyed beyond recognition, had become an American garrison. The train stopped on the quay amidst the once flowering Nyssa Park. I asked our guards what the problem was, and was told that we would have to stay in the open cattle cars until we had reached Höchst, a city west of Frankfurt. The train finally pulled out of Frankfurt. We rolled to Höchst, then through it and further westward on and on without another stop. I felt that the Americans had double-crossed us and thought of leaping off the train. But before I could act, the train stopped at sunset in the valley of the Rhine. A few rifle shots, an enormous commotion, and our caravan was surrounded by French troops. Someone speaking fluent German in a French accent announced over a loudspeaker, Keep your heads down, this is the French army, and we will shoot at any sign of disobedience. Remain calm and follow orders. Total consternation. I knew now that freedom was but a dream, that the reality would be imprisonment behind barbed wire. We cursed and complained that our transfer to the French was illegal but there was no one to hear our accusations, our anguish. That night, no one slept. We sat in the boxcars under a battery of truck headlights and threatening gun muzzles. The wolves had been entrusted with the care of the flock. At five o'clock on July 29th, we were awakened by a recording of the Marseillaise, 
followed by a candid Alsatian voice saying, Leave the cars at once. Form ranks at the riverside. Make no attempt to escape. It would prove fatal. Some 3,000 Germans dismounted and lined up as ordered. We were marched onto a swaying pontoon bridge, across the Rhine, and into the French occupation zone. Soon we were treated to an ironic spectacle. As the sun rose, its rays glinted on the huge victory monument atop the Niederwald mountain. Now the Rhine barred our way back to the relative security of the British zone, and hundreds of us would never return. We continued our march through the morning heat, driven ahead by a shouting, gesticulating detachment of French troops. By noon, we were dehydrated and fatigued as we dragged ourselves into the notorious Camp Dietersheim, a maximum security camp for prisoners of war. As we walked beneath the ornamented arch into confinement, a horse-drawn wagon rumbled by, loaded with nude, emaciated corpses. Flashing bayonets separated officers from enlisted men and forced us into a huge cage already crowded with German prisoners. Our countrymen were walking skeletons, half naked and filthy. Their hair and beards were long and snarled, their skin leathery brown and ruptured by malnutrition. For months they had lived in the open and slept exposed to the elements in holes in the ground. Every rain would turn this barren land into a sea of mud and bury men in graves they had dug with their own hands. Fred and I selected a vacant hole, buried our few belongings in the dust. As we awaited further developments, playful Moroccan soldiers continually set off hand grenades and fired rifles for their own amusement. Shortly after noon, a cart arrived with aluminum cans containing our first formal meal since the Irish stew back in Norway. It was supposed to be soup, but it looked and tasted like greasy dishwater. I told Fred that I was not going to sit around wasting away into another skeleton, 